Okay, uh, thank you very much all of you for coming in what was uh, an incredibly uh, challenging weather environment, but actually now seems to be uh, completely fine. Some of you may have struggled with the district line as well, I know I did, so if, if uh, that does apply to you, uh, all the more well done um, for coming. Uh, it's an incredible day in British politics, uh, as you all know, and I don't think we could have anyone uh, better, actually, to be addressing us uh, tonight uh, than Matthew Dancona. Uh, Matthew uh, published a book on post-truth politics, which is in a way what we're in at the moment, but possibly we've seen a, uh, the empire strike back <laughs> against that, uh, uh, that particular uh, style of politics today, but that's something he may uh, talk about. Just to introduce Matthew, uh, Matthew started off as a trainee uh, at The Times and then moved to the Sunday Telegraph uh, and then became editor of The Spectator, uh, the if you like, in-house magazine of the centre-right. Uh, and uh, he has also written for The Guardian, for The Evening Standard and for GQ magazine and he's also a visiting fellow here at uh, QM. Uh, but Matthew is not simply uh, a journalist. Indeed, he is someone who I suspect could quite easily have uh, been an academic if he weren't so clever and uh, avoided that terrible fate and decided instead to write books that people actually read. Uh, two of those books include In It Together, which is all about the coalition uh, years between 2010 and 2000. And, 15. and if you haven't seen it, it is really one of the best accounts uh, of that very fraught time in British politics. Although actually it doesn't really seem that fraught now. It seems like uh, sort of halcyon uh, and rather relaxed uh, compared to uh, what we've been through since 2016. Um, but as I say, his latest book was Post-Truth Politics. He's going to talk a little bit uh, about that tonight and extend uh, some of the uh, the lessons and some of the uh, themes that he explored uh, in that book uh, and talk about you know, um, how some of them have, have some of the developments and some of the phenomena that he uh, identified then have, if anything, um, accelerated and uh, perhaps become worse or, you know, if you're a very strange kind of person, better. Uh, he uh, is also... Now, the associate editor, deputy editor, uh, an, editor. an editor of Tortoise. And if you don't know what Tortoise is, uh, the website is uh, up there. If you're a student, uh, you can sign up uh, for free to become a member of Tortoise. And uh, Matthew will start his remarks with just a few words about what Tortoise is and what Tortoise does and what Tortoise wants to do in terms of changing the way that we do journalism in this country. So, welcome, Matthew Dancona. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Tim, and uh, uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, Please let me know if my uh, mic isn't working or you can't hear or you want me to uh, speak uh, louder or, indeed, just more quietly if you find what I'm saying boring. Um, just to uh, talk about Tortoise very briefly, um, Tortoise uh, is... is part of what's been called the slow journalism movement, uh, which is not quite what it sounds like in the sense that when you say slow journalism, people have the image of, of uh, journalists sitting around doing very little. But actually, in some, in some respects, it's the hardest job I've ever had because the whole idea, uh, which was set up by James Harding, who was um, editor of The Times and also director of news at the BBC with Katie Vanek, who was president of the Wall Street Journal and Dow Jones, um, was to kind of acknowledge the fact that we're being bombarded with uh, digital data um, and there's a case for taking a step back and trying to look uh, at the, di the governing dynamics, the deeper forces uh, beneath this and, and what's going on under certain themes like 100 year life, uh, like technology, um, like climate change, very important to us and, and, and a number of other things. Um, we post two or three pieces a day and then a little bit more at the weekend. Um, the heart of our journalism is also uh, what we call thinkings, which are sort of open source editorial conferences. Tim has been to, to several and, and made splendid contributions to them. And we've done them all over the world. And 
Tortoise is really a membership organisation rather than a subscriber service. And one of the reasons we were keen to do this tonight was because we've been uh, given by a sponsor the ability to give uh, students free membership. Now, um, a lot of people pay up to £250 a year for membership, so this is really worth having. There's only um, a limited number of them, about 5,000, which we're uh, touring around the country. So do, do join up. I mean, what have you got to lose? Um, it, really is, it really is free. And what I hope is that you'll like what you see. And then I hope even more that you'll come in to the newsroom in Fitzrovia, which is one of the things you can do as a member to the Thinkins, and tell us what you think. Because our primary purpose really is to produce journalism that's inspired at least in significant part by what our members are thinking about and um, it's interesting that 40 percent of our members already pre the, the student drive are under 30 already um, i think the young generation is really you know at, at a fascinating point and as a 51 year old i find myself more in receive than transmit mode having said that i shall now move <laughs> Uh, <laughs> elegantly into transmit mode. Um, Tim has invited me to talk about post-truth two years on. I, I wrote a book about post-truth in 2017 um, and I'll, I'll talk about that a bit and then we can have some Q&A and if you want to ask me about that that's fine but also if you are uh, interested in what's been going on today we can talk about that too. I'll leave that entirely up to you. So um, just to tell you the story so far, uh, two years ago uh, I wrote a book on post-truth that was commissioned, as you might expect, in the immediate aftermath of the Brexit referendum and, and Trump's victory. And I wrote the book in six weeks, which on reflection uh, would have really been asking for trouble ha had it not, so to speak, almost written itself, because there was so much material and so many cultural convergences at the time to highlight that it was much easier to get sent off to the printers than any book I'd ever published before. And what then happened was in a way even more interesting because I did the standard book tour of you know, festivals and signings and so on. Um, but then, and then I expected to move on to the next project, but I didn't because in fact, the subject was so big um, and everyone was talking about disinformation, fake news, post-truth, that I found myself really on, a, on what became the year of post-truth. I did about 105 um, appearances in, the, in 2017 all over the world, from Slovenia to Chile to New York, uh, and, and obviously all over this country. And what was interesting, I mean, I'd love to say that it was all down to my beautiful prose and rigorous analysis, but I'm afraid that would be a lie of sorts. Um, what people wanted was you know, reasonably well-informed speakers on post-truth because as a shorthand, that word spoke to a really deep, angst, and I think still speaks to really deep anxieties and fears and social uncertainty, and it was everywhere. So let me just whisk through the original argument. Um, the public debate about post-truth in 2016 and 17 was often dragged into really a kind of semantic cul-de-sac because so many people assumed, uh, quite wrongly, that this was just a new label for lying. Um, and asked, quite legitimately, hadn't human beings always lied? Um, you know, what about Watergate? What about Bill Clinton's impeachment? What about the Iraq dossiers? What about spin? Um, and so on and so on. And this is obviously true. Uh, mendacity is as old as language. and um, evolutionary psychologists tell us this and falsehood is an innate condition of the human of human nature and of communication so there's nothing new in that but post-truth was and is something other than that and it's something new I think and the novelty is to be found not in the lies but in our response to them it's about us not them if you like um, in 2016 Oxford Dictionary selected post-truth as their word of the year and they defined it um, as circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. And I think that gets right to the heart of the matter. Now, let's look at, review a few of the examples to which this is obviously referring. Clearly, the, the referendum was 
top of the list. And Aaron Banks, um, the, uh, the occasionally criminally investigated tycoon who <laughs> bankrolled the Leave EU campaign, was, was in fact absolutely right when he analyzed the referendum outcome thus. He said, the Remain campaign featured fact, 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 fact. It just doesn't work. You've got to connect with people emotionally, which is exactly what the Remain camp had failed to do. Instead, they bombarded the public with statistics. Um, and it became very easy to caricature this as just a torrent of indigestible data um, and no more than a series of arbitrary claims. It was a very dry campaign, very presumptuous. What the Brexiteers understood was the need for simplicity and emotional resonance. And they, they wanted a narrative that would give visceral meaning to a decision that might otherwise have been quite technical and abstract and about things like sovereignty, um, but wasn't at all. So enter Dominic Cummings, <laughs> um, campaign director at that time of Vote Leave, who argued that the case for departure had to be clear and it had to cleave to specific grievances of the public. And so they, they played around with various messages, um, one of which was go global, which might have been intellectually defensible, I don't, I don't know, but it, it certainly wouldn't have won them many votes. But Cummings had done some earlier research on Britain's potential membership of the Euro when that was an issue. And it had given him a sense of the potential traction of a pledge to take back control. Um, and he was proved right. So that was, the, that was the Brexit example. Then on the other side of the Atlantic, now Trump, I think, had been, as we know, considering a run at the presidency for a variety, under a variety of party uh, headings for, for decades. But I think he intuited, at least, uh, some, something similar to what Bre the Brexiteers did, a, sh a shift in public, in popular behavior. It was never what you might call a sympathetic candidate, that would be an absurd claim, but, and indeed, you know, the opinion polls showed that the American people were 100% aware of his many flaws. But he, he communicated a sort of brutal empathy to them, so you know, I can really describe it, um, which wasn't rooted in, or in, indeed interested in statistics or empiricism or meticulously acquired information, but a kind of this uninhibited talent for rage and impatience and the attribution of blame no matter to whom um, and there was always that assertion that he was plain speaking remember that everyone he was plain speaking and wondered what he was meant by that but it didn't mean what it meant in the past was this guy is speaking the truth what it meant was this candidate's different and he might just address my anxieties and hopes and he sees me so this was a very different model of political campaigning. And it had all sorts of ramifications. Which, so when Kellyanne Conway, uh, still I, I believe a senior aide to the president, one of the few survivors, spoke famously of alternative facts, um, she was so, sort of capturing perfectly a new epistemology, a new theory of knowledge. She, um, in, that in the post-truth era, what used to be called reality was absolutely up for grabs. And the point was not to determine the truth by a process of rational evaluation, assessment, and conclusion, but to choose your own reality as if from a buffet to suit your, your feelings. And there were lots of other forms of post-truth. The more one looked, and particularly the, the um, weaponization of conspiracy theories online, uh, more pseudoscience than there'd ever been before, really horrible, uh, growth of, hol of Holocaust denial online, and, and other uh, phenomena that fall under this umbrella. The question that inevitably this leads to is why? And I think there are two big and obvious factors. The, the social basis of the post-truth era, if you want to call it that, is the collapse of trust in traditional institutions. Um, and I think all else flows from that single poisonous source. Um, you can choose a start date. I mean. Let's look at the financial crisis of 2008, took the global economy to the brink of meltdown, it was averted only by eye-wateringly huge state bailouts for the very banks that were responsible for the disastrous collapse. And here in Britain, this was followed by, in pretty short order, by the humiliation of the political class in the parliament 
Treasury expenses scandal, something that's, you know, still, still I think, takes, takes its toll. That was in 10 years ago. Um, people still remember the £1,600 duck house and the bath plug and the pornographic films that we, as taxpayers, stumped up for. There were scandals in show business, especially Jimmy Savile at the BBC, the BBC's inability to deal with that. Uh, for my own trade of print journalism and uh, written journalism, the hacking controversy was, was a, t a total disaster, um, which forced the closure of the News of the World and the resignation of its former editor, Andy Coulson, as Cameron's Director of Communications, and Leveson's sweeping inquiry of 2011-12 into the conduct of the press, the recommendations of which have not yet been implemented in full. So in other words, we live in an age of institutional fragility. The Societies, institutions that we used to act as our guardrails, the bodies that incarnate the society's values and continuities have become much less stable, at least in our perception. And to shine a bright light on their failures or their decadence, and in some cases outright collapse, has been very unsettling. Um, and post-truth has flourished in that context. It's as uh, the firewalls and the antibodies, to mix metaphors, have weakened, um, when the putative guarantors of honesty that these institutions claim to be falter, so does truth itself. So that's factor number one. Factor number two is, uh, blindingly obvious really, digital technology, um, which was the primary indispensable engine of the change. Um, in the early years of the online revolution, uh, I'm going back to sort of pre-2007, um, it was really assumed by many, myself included, that the internet would inevitably smooth the path to sustainable cooperation and pluralism, that ba ba borders would tumble, tyrants would fall, um, and it was a kind of tech utopia. And it was a very prevalent mood uh, under the sort of heading of Web 2.0. Of course, that was not really the story as it, as it unfolded. And, here we are now, and though there are many fantastic and wonderful aspects of the internet, it's idle to deny that it has done at least as much to foster balkanization, a, a general sort of retreat into echo chambers. Um, and then it became clear that, that there, was, there were profits to be made from this, from clickbait hoaxes, unscientific medical claims, crackpot theories, fictional sightings of UFOs or Jesus or whatever. Um, the disincentives to publication were initially zero and are still, I think, insufficient. And the ease of production was seriously enticing because the means of production were marginal to zero cost. Um, and for those on social media, anonymity, of course, dramatically reduces accountability, which is a massive issue. Uh, the buzz of the hive sends the falsehood fizzing into cyberspace to do its work. Uh, and in the consequent cacophony, if you like, uh, the flow of information is increasingly dominated by peer-to-peer -peer interaction rather than the imprimatur of the old mainstream press. Uh, we consume what we already like and we shy away from the unfamiliar. So what was meant to be the ultimate generator of novelty, and in some respects still is, has also become, if you like, a curator of hearsay, folklore, and in many cases prejudice. And the crucial point is that this is not a design flaw. This is exactly what algorithms are meant to do. They are meant to connect us with things that we like or might like. They're fantastically responsive to personal taste and fantastically uninterested in veracity. Uh, so in that sense, the web was very quickly the definitive vector of post-truth precisely because it was indifferent to falsehood and honesty and the difference between the two. Um, so if digital technology is the hardware, post-truth proved to be a mighty software. And it reduced and has reduced political discourse, if you like, to a video game in which endless play on multiple levels was the sole point of the exercise. And conspiracy, theory, pseudoscience, holocaust denial, all fitted, fitted in quite neatly to this new um, ecology. So two years on, how are we doing? Okay, well, there's been, there has been progress. It's not all doom and gloom. Uh, rarely a week goes by, I don't get 
tipped off to some new fact-checking organisation that's been set up somewhere in the world. Uh, some of the, the big established ones, like Full Fact and Washington Post Fact Checker, are now really part of their you know, baked into the daily life of people interested in politics. And it's a really vibrant and a really exciting cottage industry, which not only does great work, often for next to no money, but also through its advocacy and its energy, helps in turn to encourage skepticism and to encourage, crucially, digital literacy, which is, I think, in some respects, the most important element in the fight back against post-truth. Um, and actually, the advent of you know, real-time, on-screen fact-checking during, let's say, a Trump State of the Union address is, is quite something to see and has shown what can be done with sufficient energy. Then, under the heading of digital literacy, there is, I think, now a growing understanding that tomorrow's citizens need more than you know, Saturday morning uh, private tutor lesson with the code. You know, not everyone who drives needs to know how the engine works, but everyone does know, <laughs> need to know how to drive. Um, and that recognition, I think, took a while to dawn, but it is now starting to dawn. A bit late, but it's, it's there. That tomorrow citizens need this as an absolute core civic tool. It's not a bolt-on extra. Navigating the internet is now absolutely at the heart of what it is to be a citizen. And you see BT and private companies like them sinking money into it in, in the States. There's a service called NewsGuard, which labels online sources quite intelligently using the kind of kite mark approach of nutrition labels. And, and that works quite well. And it means that if you take that approach um, to its logical conclusion, someone who lands on a site via search can at last see whether the source is authoritative uh, and whether it's a legitimate research site or satirical or strictly malevolent or whatever. And that, that I think, will be... That will be boring but important work in the years to come. Um, there's also a growing body of work by legislators. Uh, conspicuously, uh, Damien Collins, the excellent chair of the DCMS Select Committee, who produced uh, a report on fake news and misinformation, which really, I think, is sort of one of the key texts in all this. It digs really deep into what needs to be done about big tech regulation. Um, it's, as, as good, it's as good as any book on the subject about where, we, where governments go. Um, the greatest challenge for them is algorithmic transparency, what goes into the coding. And on top of that, we need a new jurisprudence, not just laws, but a kind of underpinning philosophy of law about what exactly social media services are. Um, are they old-fashioned publishers like, you know, Penguin or Bloomsbury? Well, clearly not. But they're not... Uh, unaccountable platforms, as they continue to insist. Uh, you know, absolutely not. In fact, the way in which all big social media sites have community standards of their own, sometimes patchily applied and often eccentric, sells the past. Um, what we now need, and I think, again, this, this, re this requires uh, some serious intellectual heavy lifting, um, is, uh, is what Matt Hancock used to call the third category which makes big tech companies accountable in a way that's fair and feasible and in the public interest. And my hunch is that the answer to that will lie to a considerable extent in a combination of very, very uh, astute lawmaking, of which at the moment there is zero prospect, um, and AI, uh, which is a different matter entirely, and its capacity to raise red flags that human moderation of content is simply too slow to achieve. That is really a discussion for another day. Uh, so there are some grounds for optimism, but I'm afraid that overall, you know, when Tim asked me to sort of take stock, if you like, of two years on, what did I think? The, the answer is that the picture's got worse. Um, if you take pseudoscience, which is something that has interested me until recently, I was a trustee at the Science Museum Group, and it, it was really shocking to me that, you know, the level of uh, proliferation of pseudoscience um, and snake oil. You know, yes, there have been some, uh, some. There's been some action against it. Gwyneth Paltrow's lifestyle company Goop. You may have 
in, in, heard of or encountered. It was fined $145,000 in California last year. Over its claims that it's vaginal eggs. I'm quoting, balance hormones, regulate menstrual cycles, prevent uterine prolapse, and increase bladder control. This all sounds very good. Uh, however, it wasn't true. A month later, she was reported to the National Trading Standards and Advertising Standards Authority in the UK over 113 alleged breaches of advertising law. But who was really winning? Because none of that made the slightest difference to the hundreds of devotees who shelled out £1,000 or more a ticket in June to attend Goop's Wellness Summit in June. So where are we? I mean, it's a cornerstone of the scientific revolution, it seems to me, and one worth you know, defending, that in healthcare, the only treatments and interventions that should be trusted are those that have been subjected to the boring old business of randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled testing. Uh, and it's time-consuming and it's expensive, but it's the only reliable means of establishing, well, authoritatively at least, whether a particular protocol works and, more importantly, of protecting patients from toxic side effects. And the champions of alternative therapies often cite stories of miracle cures brought about, they claim, by prodigious quantities of carrot juice or rebalanced overnight chakras. But, let us be polite, at the very least, correlation is not causation. And more, much more importantly, the plural of anecdote is not data. And the consequences of this pseudoscience and growing hostility to what's dismissed by some as the, quote, Western medicine establishment, is not, they're not just absurdities. They actually have real-life consequences for people. Um, there was a landmark study published last year in the academic journal yeah, JAMA Oncology, which collated evidence from almost 1,300 patients. And it showed that those who used complementary treatments were more than twice as likely to die at any point during the nine-year study, usually because they had refused to complete courses of conventional therapy. So that alone, as a data point, is shocking, I think. Worst of all, in my view, the anti-vax movement, which has its immediate origins in the case of Andrew Wakefield, and his long discredited claims in 1998 about the alleged links between the MMR jab and autism, spreading the world like wildfire. Uh, measles cases have soared in Europe as parents have persuaded themselves, encouraged by the internet, that expertise um, has been relocated from the professions and institutions to the individual. And often uh, wisdom that is sort of turbocharged by celebrity. Uh, you see that in, all, all, in many of these cases, celebrity plays an important role. So to be clear, my point about pseudoscience is not just about fashionable lifestyle choices, it's about life and death. Politics, well, good day for it. Um, <laughs> you know, what can I say? Look at Trump, if you can bear it, with his sharply amended map of the United States, used to vindicate his entirely bogus claim that Alabama was one of the states at risk from Hurricane Dorian. Um, I was looking at the Washington Post, they've tallied more than 12,000 false or misleading statements by him since he took office. Um, we're all aware of his relationship with the truth and his use of social media in that regard. But please, please, please note, he is still in office. He is running for a second term next year. Um, impeachment has been promised since the very day he entered the Oval Office. But the li and this is the really alarming thing. The lying has become so commonplace, it's become such a reliable feature of each seething presidential tweet that lands in our, in our timeline. It's so baked into the share price that to use, you know, it, it it's just seems to be surprising or even sadly outrageous um it's just trump being trump it's the predictable conduct of a habitual and unrepentant liar uh, which i think is not the correct response but it it is it is what happens in uh, as hannah arendt and others have remarked you know it is what happens in authoritarian regimes is there's, you become habituated to it and to a certain extent resign to it now, we face a similar problem in this country, uh, we, uh, undoubtedly. Um, I don't think we did quite to the same extent, but with Boris Johnson and Number 10, we do. 
Um, people say it's just Boris being Boris. Uh, how often in the past 20 years I ha have I heard, not least from my own colleagues in the media who uh, carry a heavy share of the blame, uh, this justification of the latest liar or assault on the truth by him, as though different rules regarding political honesty apply to different people. Um, and the, 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 the shocking thing is that before today's ruling, it appeared that they just might. Um, I, I can't say, but we can maybe talk about this a little bit afterwards, but I can't say with any confidence what the outcome of today's ruling will be. Uh, what I do think is that whatever else it is, it's just the beginning. Um, don't expect this gang to fold so quickly. As I mean, every, every prime minister, I was going through a list on the way here, and I was trying to think of a prime minister who would have hung on as he has today, and I couldn't think of one. You know, whoever you think of, um, they'd all have gone by now, or would be preparing to go tomorrow. He's different. Um, he has Dominic Cummings beside him, uh, which is its own story. Um, a man held in contempt of parliament as his chief advisor. Um, every Tory, Every Tory member and MP that voted for Johnson in the Conservative leadership election knew that he is a pathological liar. Everyone, but they still handed him victory by a landslide. Uh, since in entry Downing Street, he has lied about his reasons for suspending Parliament. He has lied about the million to one chance of no deal. He has lied about the progress of talks in Brussels on a new deal. And he may even have lied about when a picture with his girlfriend was taken after their much publicized row. It's, he is nothing if not com comprehensive. He is thorough. So I suppose the question that bugs me is how much do we care? Um, at least before today's uh, bombshell, he, he was still way ahead in the polls. And that may reflect Corbyn's implosion since his 2017 surge. But more alarmingly, and I think we'll find out quite quickly, uh, it may also reflect something we don't want to confront, which is, for many people, the populist sugar rush that Johnson provides is more important to them than his tenuous relationship with the truth. Um, as I say, we'll find out fairly soon, but in a way that seems to me too passive a way of putting it. Um, the fact is, and all my deliberations on post-truth always come back to this very difficult reality, is that we have to decide, all of us, how we want this to go. Um, there is no pendulum in human affairs, political affairs. There's, there is no natural swing back to the comfortable status quo or the centre or the centre-left or whatever you want to call it. There, are those, there is only human agency. That is, that is all there is. Um, and it's only human agency that will restore truth to its proper place in the hierarchy of, of social and cultural values. Uh, it, it, we need a collective determination not to put up with delusions and lies and with falsehood, however comforting they may be. And this is the crunch because populism thrives for all sorts of reasons, but one of the reasons it is doing so well is that we live in an age of impatience and instant gratification where we want simple answers to complex problems. Um, we want policy making to be as instantaneous as, as delivery or, or Uber, and it just, you know, that's a category error, but that, that is how we are wired at the moment. Uh, re representative democracy with all its slowness is a hard sell at the moment compared to the, the sort of butch direct democracy that Trump and Johnson and Auburn and others sell. Um, you know, post-truth thrives in an environment where the truth is difficult, where it's abrasive, it's hard to absorb, it's nuanced, it's messy, uh, which in a way is a way of describing complex uh, globalized society. And we, we talk about truth as if it's benign somehow, and it, its impact may be benign, and that may be so in the broader sense that a society that alienates itself from truth uh, cannot long be healthy. But we have to con also confront, I think, the fact that the truth often hurts. And at this point, I'm going to put my hard hat on and offer a couple of closing observations, which you may not like or find congenial, but I've always thought that university is a mind gym, not a crash. So 
I'll try. The first thing is this. As long as you care more about your feelings than you do about facts, this whole argument will be a sideshow. And by the way, when I say you, I don't mean you personally, but one. Nobody should seek out to offend anyone else for the hell of it, but there is and cannot be a right not to be offended. There cannot be a right to insist upon your own beliefs prevailing simply because of your strength of opinion or your declared vulnerability. No such right can exist in a pluralist society. Indeed, the more diverse we become, and the better for it in my view, the more we must learn the skills of anti-fragility. Recognizing that while words may incite violence, and that the law quite correctly pro prohibits such violence inciting rhetoric, that words in and of themselves are not a form of violence. That is neuroscientific nonsense, and it is a road to relativistic hell. Once you allow that words alone are a form of physical endangerment, you sell the past to any proto-tyrant who wants to claim that what you say is intrinsically dangerous. I warn you, do not assume that the people doing the banning will always be nice, progressive people. Look at what Bolsonaro is doing to socialist academics on the campuses of Brazil. Look at Orban. If you want truth, you have to accept not an absolute right to free speech, which nobody accepts, I think, except for the most demented libertarians, but at least a social predisposition towards it. And this brings with it a cost. And if you think that free speech is a right-wing ideal, which has become a very common, in my view, lazy trope, go read some history and start with Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist, via apartheid, the dissidents of the Soviet era, and those who today struggle in theocratic regimes all over the world, and then tell me that it's a right-wing ideal. So that's the first. Second, if you're committed to facts, to verifiable reality. You have to embrace that with commit a commitment in all its harshness. You have to hug the cactus, so to speak. And that means on Tories, for example, accepting that what they call in, in pretty shady doctrine, jargon, fiscal conservatism, also means life-changing and sometimes life-ending austerity and cuts. But it also, here I take a deep breath. It means acknowledging that in the fraught debate about gender and transgenderism, feelings alone cannot be the only guide to how we speak about the clash of ideas and, our, and rights that has arisen. It's not transphobic, repeat, it's not transphobic, or at least not in any meaningful sense, to say that except in this vanishingly small number of intersex babies, Biological sex is a chromosomal and physiological reality, not a label assigned by a health professional. Gender is indeed a social construct, and triple underlining, people should feel free to adopt the gender they wish. The protection of trans and gender neutral people from harassment and worse is a high priority. The Gender Recognition Act should indeed be reforms long overdue to make the process of transitioning less, less demeaning. But all that is a world away from insisting as many do that, for instance, lesbians should, ought to, feel attracted to trans women, or that trans women who still have all the physiological advantages of natal men should be entitled to participate in women's sport. You may know that the prominent gender critical feminist Magdalene Burns died very, long, very young last week from brain cancer, which is just a, 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 a huge human sadness. It was really depressing in that context, I thought, to see Dr. Rachel McKinnon, uh, the transgender cycling champion, tweeting that, and I'm quoting, don't be the sort of person who people you've harmed are happy you're dying of brain cancer. When I read that, I thought, this is part of post-truth too, and we have to own it if we're going to be serious about it. Now, I'm aware this is sensitive terrain. It's less easy to come to a campus and talk about that than it is to talk about Trump and Brexit. But I wanted to be honest with you about where we were. I think that's the point. We have to decide whether we want a world dominated and regulated by emotion in all its forms, or one in which reason, evidence, and reality in all their difficult, complicated, sometimes unpalatable reality still prevail. That's the really hard bit, and that's what will make the difference. 
that truth is not a right or a service, it's something you choose. Thank you very much. Right, well, thank you very much to Matthew. Uh, now I'm going to turn it over to you. So we have 20 minutes or so for questions. So uh, who would like to uh, take the first one? Okay, let's just... Uh, okay, uh, we'll take them in bunches of uh, two or three. So turn them here, uh, turn them there. I've got one more, ideally. Oh, am I missing someone? Okay, uh, gentlemen over there as well. Uh, Muhammad Amin, how much responsibility do you attach to politicians who themselves are very aware of the truth, but nevertheless promote people like Donald Trump or Boris Johnson because they enable them to get other things that they want, such as major corporate tax cuts in the USA or a departure from the European Union, as in the case of the UK? even though they know those people are frauds and charlatans. Uh, I think it was you, wasn't it? Was it me? Yeah, go on. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll go next. Thank you. Hi, I'm Toby Green, a research fellow here. I've got a particular question about a, a new wave of post-truth technologies in relation to deep fake. Um, this um, potential to create videos in which people appear to say things that they, that they never said. You could have, for example, videos of world leaders saying whatever you want, perhaps declaring war, threatening nuclear strikes on other countries, or you can imagine all kinds of terrifying scenarios where this technology uh, represents a whole new kind of um, threat um, in all kinds of different ways. Um, do you think this is um, a qualitatively different order of threat um, in terms of deep fake? And what should be the response to it? Is this a kind of technology which ought to be um, prescribed in some way or even legislated against because of its potential uh, harm? Hi. Um, you've presented a very compelling argument tonight um, about the sort of seismic shift in the truth environment over the last 50 years. Do you think that, um, I mean, particularly in this country and to a lesser extent worldwide, actually our political institutions have held up surprisingly well? considering how seismic the shift has been? Such good questions. Um, I mean, let, me, let me start with, let me take them in order. Um, I mean, yes, of course, uh, there, is a, there is a sort of horrific culture of complicity around both Trump and, and Boris Johnson. Um, I remember being assured by a cabinet minister um, about six months ago uh, that he would n under no circumstances ever allow, let alone vote for, um, Boris Johnson to become one of the final two candidates. That he was going to set him his face to keeping him out of the final two candidates that went to the members on the assumption the members would choose Boris Johnson. That person then went on to become a leading figure in the Boris Johnson campaign. So I think that kind of answers that. But I, I and, and indeed Trump, it's one of the saddest things for me has been watching Lindsey Graham, actually, who's someone I've met a few times uh, when he was sort of John McCain's wingman and was always a very liberal and interesting Republican. Um, he played an honorable part in uh, getting some of the Bush torture uh, uh, policies revoked and, and, and trying at least to close Guantanamo. So it's been very sorry. It's been very sad and depressing to watch Lindsey Graham becoming a shill for Trump. You're right. I mean, they, in, in both situations, they they see the, 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 these leaders as a, a means of getting through. Uh, they see a new age of populism dawning. They want to keep their seats or their districts, and they are, for the moment, prepared to stay with the status quo. I'd be fascinated to see in the morning's papers how the Conservative Party is behaving. Um, you know, never, it is, you know, it is, it's always a battle between lust for power and cravenness, really. We'll see which, <laughs> whether they march together. Um, but, I, but I just want to add a grace note to that, which is, I can criticise the political class in all this, but I really feel, particularly with Boris, that my own 
trade is is hugely to blame. And I, I've written about this sort of from a personal perspective a couple of times because um, I think we I, we and we gave them an easy ride. I think there's no two ways about it. Um, and uh, I was never part of his social circle, um, and I was, certainly wasn't one of those uh, true believers amongst common commentators who thought he was destined for number ten. But you know, I can't be sure that I didn't pull my punches. Um, and I think, as a as a trade, we we behave very badly. And I think that you know, if Boris Johnson had been an accountant, he wouldn't be number ten in number ten today, uh, which is not a happy reflection. So I, before I kind of turn my guns on politicians, I think the first, you know, columnist heal thyself, I think is the first lesson of the, the Johnson experience. Deep fake is really interesting because it's, I mean, it, it's proponents say, look, you know, what's the difference between deep fake and uh, Peter Cushing's uh, image being rebuilt in Rogue One and, you know, it's, 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 it's just a special effect. Come on, relax. Um, but of course, as your question implied, it's, it's no such thing. I mean, purpose and motivation are terribly important in this and, and indeed are important to the whole uh, response to post-truth because the Pelosi example of Nancy Pelosi being shown to be uh, in, in this deep fake, it implied that it made her look as if she was drunk or in some other way impaired. And it, it was potentially very politically damaging. And then I think YouTube sort of thought about it and, and then erred on the side of, well, you know, it's just satirical. Um, my, my sort of interim position is that we're at a stage where the minimum we need is labelling. You know, this is, a, this is and, and, and proper labelling. I don't mean small print labelling. I mean, you know, a, a bloody big button on it saying this is a satirical video. Um, if there's anything which could be confused with, you know, that has a degree of digital verisimilitude, that it could be confused for the real thing and isn't, if it's to stay on a platform, it has to be labelled as such. I suspect that won't be enough because I think that as the technology becomes more and more advanced um, and the speed with which this is done becomes greater, this is going to be an area of real... Um, contestation between big tech and governments because uh, it will become so easy, as you imply, to... I mean, declaration of war is, is, is a very good example. Um, and I think that... that uh, I mean, I know that the technology that isn't in use yet is already far ahead of what we have. So it just adds to the list of things that politicians are going to have to get their heads around. And this is something I do where I am critical of politicians is that I mean, the, the level of knowledge amongst most politicians, Damien Collins being a tremendous uh, exception, Matt Hancock too, um, is really woefully... I, I mean, I, I appeared before the uh, DCMS Select Committee when it was doing its fake news thing, and I, one of the, the MPs asked me what an app was. Um, and that's just not acceptable. Um, so, I think, you know, you, let, I mean, to give you another example, it is crazy that the rule governing referendums and elections was passed in 2000 hasn't been significantly amended. That's four years before Facebook was invented. Seven before the iPhone became readily available. I mean, it, 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 it's a fossil. It's a, it's a legislative fossil. So one of the things that, that Parliament is going to have to, and legislators around the world, are going to have to become better at uh, is, is legislating at least not 15 years behind technology that's available in every home. That would be a good start. Um, it's a terrible, I mean, you know, what, what a, a terrible moment to be leaving the EU because actually, as everyone knows, supranational regulation on these things is much, much better. Um, but anyway, that's, that's under advisement. Um, and the final question was an absolutely fascinating counterintuitive one, which was, isn't it amazing that it's not worse? And I think you might be right. Um, yes, I, 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 I do think that's true. Um, and I certainly don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, I've, I've, I have, however, reached a point where I think that the only form of safety lies in radicalism, in that I, you know, I'm obviously delighted that the, the Supreme Court is, uh, has done what it's done today. But I also feel that we've cut a lucky break rather than turn back the tide. 
And I think that, um, I mean, this has made me personally uh, not an advocate of something that I never really uh, was sold on, uh, of a codified constitution, which is an incredibly difficult undertaking, it will take years, has all sorts of difficulties, you know, presents the desperately complex problems for a, a society such as ours that's been based on long incremental constitutional development. What are rights? What are rights that are for judges to decide and lie outside the, the realm of, of, of statute law and so on and so on? These are beyond current thinking. But I, I do think that while you're right that, that it's remarkable it hasn't been worse, I feel that um, that's not quite sufficient grounds for uh, KBO. Um, I, I just wanted to ask um, how much responsibility you feel the media have to challenge untruths and how far they can go to um, introduce um, uh, a sort of balance in the debate. Also, how, what, what you feel about collusion and how, how far the BBC is a, a mouthpiece for the government and, you know, what, what the, the, the powers, you know, how they balance out. <laughs> One thing that strikes me is how totally ineffective leaders on the centre left have been in challenging all this stuff. And in the Labour Party, you know, Jeremy Corbyn has been totally ineffective. He's not really attacking Boris Johnson and the Tories at all. Or we get our platitudes about inequality and injustice in this world. And it, 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 it's all very abstract sort of stuff. And the same thing happened um, with Hillary Clinton's campaign in 2016. And all you got from Hillary, I remember, of in, was long lectures on green energy to the miners, miners of West Virginia. And why have they, the center left has been so ineffective? The only person I can think of who would have been any good was Tony Blair. And um, in today's Labour Party, he is the great Satan. And I can't see in, in, in the Democratic Party, is there anyone there who can give Trump a hard time in 2020? I can't see anyone doing it. Hi, yes, um, I'm the guy at the back. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I guess my question is a bit of uh, criticism. You know, we get those two wealthy, very privileged white guys saying lies all the time, having no, um, you know, consequences, and the whole world becomes post-truth. I think when we look at it, there's a lot of people not lying out there, and, you know, we don't call, they get called, called out for it, called out for it, and um, are we not just finding excuses for those very privileged people by just creating a new paradigm, whereas, you know, some people are not playing on the same ground. Well, um, if, if you, I mean, underpinning your question, which really interests me, um, is uh, the question about is there a level playing field and the spectacularly isn't. Um, and indeed, one of the things I think, is something I'm working on at the moment, I think one of the great um, benefits of identity politics, which is much maligned, has been a greater understanding of privilege, and, and uh, you know we have to take greater account of that. Uh, particularly people like myself, who've been sort of schooled in the Enlightenment liberal tradition. Um, so you're right. I mean, of course, I mean Trump and Johnson are the their avatars for white male privilege. I mean, I'm not quite sure what more they could have. I mean, neither of them are aristocratic, whether that matters. But anyway, I mean, they're pretty, let's face it, they, they, they tick most of the boxes. Um, I, I certainly don't think um, that uh, 
the intention, at least, of those who've written about post-truth, myself included, uh, James Ball, Evan Davis, uh, Peter Pomeratz. Um, uh, there's another very good book recently out. I'll just it'll come to me in a minute. Um, are, are in any way kind of trying to suggest this as an excuse. In other words, um, white guys start doing it so truth doesn't exist anymore. Of course, you're right. I mean, there's, 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 there's still plenty of truth around. Um, it is just, I mean, post-truth, one of the things I always wanted to make clear and, and perhaps failed to do so is that, you know, post-truth is just a shorthand. It's a way of encouraging a discussion about what's going on in the world, you know, with Modi, with Orban, with Trump, with Johnson in Italy, elsewhere. Um, it isn't actually culture-specific. We tend to uh, focus on sort of mid-Atlantic uh, crisis because um, that's where a lot of the sort of media perhaps wrongly focus. I mean, that, that I think is a fair criticism, mm -hmm. if that's part of what you're saying. But believe me, my intention is not to um, declare truth dead. Um, I mean, I, I want it back. My concern is how to do that. And I'm, you know, I'm setting my face to find ways of, of encouraging it. Although, you know, it is, uh, it is, it is, it is I think, a, a decades long rather than a years long struggle. Um, very interesting question about the centre-left, the Labour Party, the ineffectuality of uh, its response to all this. Um, I mean, I, I would... It's interesting you mentioned Hillary Clinton because in a funny way, you know, she's an example of what happens if you do tell the truth. You know, she, she, she told the miners that their, their minds weren't going to open again and lost. Trump said, all the mines are going to reopen, all the steelworks are going to reopen, I'm going to spend trillions on infrastructure, vote for me, and he won. Um, so the, the lesson that aspiring politicians will draw from that is it's probably better to lie um, because people will swallow it. Because it's in the nature of populism, this is, I think, one of its, its structural perils. Populism starts by saying, we're going to offer you everything. We're going to build a wall. We're going to leave Europe. It's going to be fantastic. No more immigrants. No more welfare ground. It's going to be, you're going to love it. It's going to knock your socks off. And then, of course, it doesn't work because policy making is incredibly complicated, uh, and it leads to inconsistencies and injustices. And people say, "Hang on a minute, how did that happen?" Populism then has a round two argument, which is always the great betrayal. Ah, well, you see, and this is how Trump will campaign in 2020. If only the elites had allowed me to do what I was trying to do, I would have been able to clean the swamp, build the wall, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and you know, stand by for the briefings overnight, as we learn that. I saw a briefing reported on social media from number 10, which was basically saying, judges, you know, who cares about them? They're all establishment. You know, it's, it's already happening. Um, and I wonder if there's a market for that. And I think that, that if you look at... I don't think this is narrowly party political, actually. I mean, I think that, that, that Labour... Um, a lot of people concentrate on, on Corbynism as, as in terms of its leftness. But I think what's interesting is its populism. And I think that one of the reasons that he did so well in 2017 was that he, he fought a very successful and very adept populist campaign. You know, it was a simple. It was based on his own you know, quite uh, humble manner. Um, he seemed uh, you know, gratifyingly different to the robotic Theresa May. Um, and it was, it, was a, it was quite a straightforward left-wing populist agenda. And at the moment, I think the problem is that politicians are frightened of, of stepping away from the populist plate. They really are. It's a difficult moment. And encouraging them to do so is, is again, going to be the work of decades because at the moment, populism appears to work. So I'm afraid I don't have a, uh, a just had water answer to your question, which is a very good one. Um, fascinating question about media's duty to tell the truth. Well, I mean... If that's not our duty, what, I'm not sure what it, you know, if that's not the job, I'm not sure what I'm doing for a living. I think that the, it was interesting that you then talked about balance, because I think that part of the problem um, in the panic uh, that followed various things in the media, including in the early part of this century, including the internet revolution, various scandals and so on, was uh, the desire for clickbait and so on, was that 
we confuse balance with truth. And so, actually, they're not the same thing. Um, it's much more important to sort of be Socratic, which is to pursue... This is why I think James O'Brien is, in some respects, the best interviewer in the country, which is that he pursues his interviewees um, with a terrier-like insistence on finding out the truth. It, it's, he doesn't sort of say, on the one hand, on the other, as if, as if all the establishment of truth is always an adversarial process. And indeed, we've, we've seen in the early history, and one, I think one of the disasters for the climate change debate was the way in which broadcasters felt um, that what you had was someone from the science community that represented 99.999% of scientists saying, by the way, there's a climate emergency on its way, and then someone from a paid for think tank saying, no, there isn't. And the, the broadcaster would go from one to the other, and the, you could see the scientist tearing out his or her hair, saying, but, but you know, these figures, the, and the climate, uh, climate denier would say, no, it doesn't. And this was, but the, what was de depressing was that was treated as a successful segment, because it was balanced. Whereas actually, the duty to be right is more important than the duty to be first or the duty to be balanced. And these are very, very difficult, again, very difficult lessons for um, the press to take on board, particularly at the moment. And one of the things, that, again, going back to Tortoise, I enjoy about no longer in that particular area being governed by the daily news uh, sort of pressure is that we have the time to go off and get things right. And I feel that, that, that in, in our way, we are doing our bit, I hope, to re recover trust in the media, because I think trust in the media is in the gutter, and there are good reasons why. And we have a job of work, I mean, real work, to get, get that trust back. Um, and I think that, that mo much of the critique that's, le that, that's leveled at the media is correct. I'm not sure about the BBC being in the pockets of the government. Um, I worked, I did two days a week for the Today programme um, a few years ago, and I, I, I wouldn't, if I had to kind of characterise the general leaning of BBC staff and BBC presenters, it certainly wouldn't be sort of Johnsonian. Um, I think that what happened was that there was a, there's a perception for some reason that Laura Koonsberg is a Tory, which I think flows from the fact that she was going to do a um, a fringe event at a Tory conference, and as is the way with these things, this grew up into her being essentially a member of the, the Conservative youth or something. I mean, it was ridiculous. Um, I, can, I can only say it how I see it. I mean, I, I, I see a lot of the BBC uh, from the inside, and that is not what I see. But, you know, it, the proof is in the pudding. If that's how people perceive it, that will be very damaging to its claims for charter renewal and con the continuation of the licence fee in an environment where the notion of basically paying a tax on owning a television is going to look more and more antiquated. Okay, time for a couple more sure. questions. Yes, uh, you have your hand up and the lady there. Uh, so those two. All right, so the premise of my question is the fact that both the Trump campaign and the uh, leave no yeah leave eu.org campaign both hired um, Cambridge Analytica to run their social media um, advertising so given the fact that um, using populism and using people's emotions is so po politically advantageous what sort of incentives do you think should be put in place to actually convince these politicians to regulate the relationship between big data companies and uh, politicians and given the fact that we as the citizens of the countries are part of the problem because we're using our emotions to actually um, decide which political candidate we want to vote for. Uh, so given that fact, do you really think that we could actually mobilize enough people to actually um, create the demand for such regulation in the first place? Hello. Yes, you said you wanted truth back. I was hoping that you could elaborate on something that you hinted at earlier, which was the role of technology or algorithms in fact-checking itself, and also how we can be sure of maintaining trust in fact-checking institutions themselves. Uh, well, to, to address that one first, 
your right to imply is I think you do that uh, you know, anyone can set up a fact checking institution and the way that corporate interests act it may already be the case that there are organizations posing as fact checkers that are actually you know funded by uh, I mean I have a feeling I'm not I'm not sure about this I have a feeling there's going to be an almighty global row about vaping in the next few years uh, with competing sides of the argument saying that actually it's completely safe and people saying hold on it may not be as safe as it first looked and you can bet that there'll be you know things with strange names like the institutes of, of the facts in health suddenly emerging and the answer to that is to uh, insist upon transparency in funding and there are uh, I mean you can get to well, regulators of regulators of regulators but there are very good organizations that that give think tanks and fact organizations like fact checking scores about the transparency they do in funding which I think is um, absolutely crucial um, as for the role of technology well there are already a number of uh, I mean DeepMind I think is, is already quite a long way advanced in um, trying to work out trying to teach machines to chase ver <laughs> to chase veracity um, and I'm not enough of a technologist to uh, to to I'm not equal to the task really but suffice it to say that in the same way as it's possible to teach a child um, how to have a reasonably good uh, go at guessing whether something is prima facie worth uh, testing for, for, for lies you can get there I, I'm not I think this is a longer haul I think the we're at the moment with the AI revolution that happened a bit with the first with the the, the dot-com bubble bursting which is that we, people make sort of slightly crazy claims about it it's gonna you know, tomorrow you're gonna wake up and there's gonna be 15 robots in your kitchen and you never have to do anything again um, and then it won't work and everyone will say AI is rubbish it was all nonsense and then 10 years down the line we'll realize that it wasn't and it actually has changed everything fundamentally um, but I do think that the most interesting aspect of AI is where it can simulate uh, if that's the word I, again it's you know some AI experts say to me no it's not simulation it's like it is exactly the same thing as human cognition I can't quite get my head around that but they, they can absorb data and uh, come to the same sort of conclusions that we do but in a but in a very very detailed and dense way that and this is the crucial bit in conjunction with human agency can be of assistance I what I don't think you can ever do is delegate truth testing to to C3PO I don't I don't believe that I, that's not that's that way I mean people will claim that you can but I I'm too old to go for that um, so that's my position on that. Cambridge Analytica and AIQ and their role in the referendums. Well, I mean, the interesting thing about it is that we've really learned nothing in the sense that the, we've learned everything and then we're doing nothing. Um, the Collins report on all this spells it all out in great detail. Carol Cadwallader's uh, amazing investigative reporting. If you haven't seen The Great Hack on Netflix, watch it. It's an incredible journey through all that. Um, but still, we don't we, we don't have new regulations on on the statute book or or anything. Um, the electoral commission's response to it all has been very very weak. I mean, I think for a just for a kickoff, we need to know who's paying for political advertising and where's it coming from. And in the same way, there's very detailed rules governing what you can. I mean, I couldn't just put up a a, a poster on the side of this wall saying "Vote for Matt." Um, without declaring who paid for it, getting permission from the university, and so on and so on and so on. But I can fire things into Facebook and Twitter feeds if I pay of any sort, and they can be bespoke, and then they disappear. And at the moment, there's really no way of knowing what's, what's coming and going. And it was interesting that, that um, some people are getting better at, 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 at sort of monitoring this and have been charting in a very, very sketchy sort of garage way, what's going on. And it's interesting how um, from sources sometimes outside the UK, a lot of pro-Boris ads of, uh, of the sort that we saw during the referendum are starting to be fired into the system. As I said, the legislation we have is totally blind to all this. So it won't, it won't help. And this is of enormous concern to people who are looking 
at the next those sort of in the civil service, um, even people in the intelligence community looking at the next election, worried about, and the, the constant refrain you hear is, stop arguing about 2016, start thinking about the next one, the next referendum, the next election. And I think that is a very, very good sort of, it's a good philosophy. Because um, the people, what we saw in 2016 was just the beginning. I mean, it was, it was, it was prototypical data use. Uh, compared to the sophistication that's already possible, the, the, the amount that you can be known about you from your Instagram, from your uh, Twitter feed, from your Facebook, other you know, dating sites, everything, is unbelievably accurate. And the, uh, the tailoring of political advertising to people is, is, is I think, and I, I use the word that I don't use very often advisedly terrifying and I think that in a way that has to be that should be the the the, the transparency uh, and about funding origin and content of digital ads should be clause one of the new act that at some point I hope in my lifetime is passed by parliament on this um, and if there's one reason to get Brexit or out the way or have a people's vote and forget about the whole thing it's so we can get back to this business because it is holding up crucial civic tasks like that. Okay, well look, uh, I would just like to uh, say thank you very much to Matthew. Uh, that was uh, hugely enjoyable as well as hugely stimulating. I learned an awful lot and I thought an awful lot. If you enjoyed that... Uh, and sign up to Tortoise. Yeah, sign up to Tortoise. But also... Um, if I don't know how you come to be here uh, tonight, whether you just saw it on social media uh, and, uh, or in some other way, if you're not already signed up to the Myland Institute and uh, our mailing list, please go to our website. You can do that there. Then you'll get our uh, kind of regular updates about things that are going on. We've got all sorts of events coming up in uh, the next academic year. Uh, I won't. Uh, go into all of them now because you can see um, some of them as they come up on our website and as I said if you sign up you'll get uh, newsletters uh, and uh, they will tell you uh, about them. Uh, so it remains for me to say um, thank you for coming, do enjoy the drinks and nibbles afterwards and please say thank you to our guest Matthew Danko. Thank you.